I I'm not understanding it, but uh, what you mean to say to do that. It's too Okay, it's it's time to get started. So uh, we need a Jabber scribe and a note taker. Hello. Can we get started, please? We need a Jabber scribe and a minute taker. Thank you. Need someone to take minutes, please. You're going to do it? Thank you, Max. OK, a reminder that uh, we're under the IETF note well. If you're not familiar with this, please get familiar before you speak. Uh, posted the agenda a couple weeks ago. Didn't see any abashes on the list. Are there any now? Okay. So the uh, we have four documents that are with the. Hey, Russ. One thing. So we had this. I did a, a presentation a while ago, which was a not a non-working group draft about a key update for fifty-four eighty. It's not on the list, so. I didn't think it actually had to be on there because this is updates in the draft uh -huh. order. So five seconds at the end if you got it. OK. So um, we have four documents that are with the uh, ISG or the RC editor. Um, I'm unaware of anything on the first three that needs to be reported. 
are there well maybe i'll just do it this way quinn do you have anything on sh on either of the shakes documents no nope. okay the there's nothing on the hash sig doc and we had um ad review on the nope wrong document so nothing on that one either um so, so it's Roman engineer. So I think on those four, they're all actually with the editor. Yep, I think, I think that's right. Through. I think that's exactly right. Um, I got it confused with the Seaboard document for a moment. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So we have one working group uh, document where we have active discussion we need to have. And then we're going to, I think Bernie's going to brief that in a minute. And then uh, we have some things that are being considered for um, charter. The charter, I believe, is on the first telechat in December. Uh, so we're going to uh, continue to work on those, assuming that's going to pass. Uh, and then we have some other business if time allows. We have a very short meeting today, so um, we want to make sure we get to that. Um, the first thing then is Bernie. Yep, you may if you wish, but I find it doesn't work. <laughs> It works. Good. Good. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Bernie Hönneisen. Get closer. Closer. Okay. Now you can hear me. My name is Bernie Hönneisen, and I will talk about header protection requirement and use cases. We have been talking already during two ITFs about the topic, so this time we are not anymore going to into we are not anymore going to the details of the requirements. This will be rather a summary. That quick uh, recall what you're talking about. Uh, on the left side, we have a typical email, like we have a header, the orange part, and the content, the green part. The content can be protected by the means we have. The headers usually cannot be protected, or the header section can usually not be protected. And as mime 3.1 says, okay, put the whole uh, message and drop it inside another one, which is then the red header that cannot be protected, but all the rest can be protected, including the original headers, like the orange ones here. So this is just like to remind you, to remind you what we're talking about. Then we made a document drafting requirements and use cases based on the feedback we got last time and some other uh, Feedback, we did the following things. Move the implementation considerations to appendix because this is kind of really early work in progress and uh, may up in another document that is talking about the solution. Then simplified one requirement. Uh, this was about header fields that should not be included in the clear text or that are not included in the clear text. Then added a new requirement that will also be on the next slide as an open issue that we may close. It's about the case where encryption is only applied without signature, that uh, how to deal with that. And then we added one example of one implementation doing header protection, which is the PEP implementation and explained it a bit more, added more information, this BCC discussion we had last time, that's one of the outcomes from last time. Uh, you remember that for BCCs, we have to produce at least two, sometimes three different kind of messages that have BCC to preserve the original purpose of the BCC. And that abstract was short and other editorial changes. That's just for information. 
Now we have the slide with the open issues. I collected four open issues of which the last one is a bit proto. So the first one I already mentioned is, are we now clear that whatever we document here in the encryption only case, so the case where it's only encrypted, we are not saying anything for the sending side because it's not really a recommended state, but we are saying something about if you receive such email and how we treat it basically a documentation of the receiving side. Is that the common understanding in the room or is it not? Or can we close this open issue? Nobody wants to comment on this, so I presume this is the conclusion of the discussion of this issue and it will be like this. Good. Then the next one, we had one requirement that was not clear whether it should be in or not. Like, uh, do we want to require a single format that uh, covers all protection levels, like uh, signed only or signed an encryption which are left? Do we want a single format or is it okay if it's a should or should it be a must? Or don't we want to talk about that at all? Are there any opinions on this? Hi, this is Daniel Khan Gilmore from the ACLU. Um, <clears throat> I think if we only define signed only messages, then we are missing a big chunk of what people want this for. Uh, I think if we define encryption only without signing, we are um, also missing a major piece. So I think this document needs to have um, both signatures over clear text messages as well as um, Encrypted messages. Encrypted messages with signature or without signature? So, uh, how do I put this? <laughs> the receiving end is going to receive messages that are encrypted whose signatures they cannot validate simply because we are terrible at validating signatures effectively. There's just mm -hmm. too many error cases. So, yes, we will need to handle the case where your message is encrypted, but the signature cannot be validated. Okay. Um, but I don't think we should be encouraging people to create encrypted messages that are not signed. Okay. That would be in line with the point one. Yeah. Was I, your I still don't, I cannot assign your comment. Was it on the second point or on the first point? Let me do, try to do a clarification. This requirement is actually was about the way we do header protection will be done the same way for signing an encryption case. We don't want two different ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's more of an implied assumption. So I hope nobody can test this, but this is just to confirm. Okay. Yeah, is this this one? Yeah, am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's what okay, you, good. yeah. Okay, so I see no resistance to keep that in. And it would, should be probably on a shoot basis uh, for the time being. Okay, so any more comments on the point two here, on the issue two? So then the issue three is a bit more um, difficult. Um, actually, that was our referring to before. We left it open. We started, actually Russ started an email discussion, which nobody was really engaging in. To what extent we are like addressing the backward compatibility requirements and not sure whether we get anything out today, which we didn't get out last time, but maybe I should show it. Uh, it's on my backup slides. It's basically about these requirements. And we are pretty clear on the B1, but all the rest is a bit unclear whether we should do this or not. Basically, it's about feature negotiation kind of stuff. Like, do we need to tell other clients what kind of stuff we support? And one issue was like, if you have different clients reading the same mailbox, uh, you end up not being in a clear area. So are there any comments on this? Or... What should we do with that? How much of this should we address here? Uh, Alexi, I think 
these two issues, well, this is sort of two types of issues, uh, uh, distinguishing between forwarded and wrapped and yeah. capability negotiation. I yeah. think we'll get to them, but I think they're probably simpler issues that the main choice we need to make about how we protect the header. And once we make the choice, it will be much easier to decide, you know, which way it's going to be addressed. That's kind of true, yeah. This is Daniel Khan Gilmore. Um, so I think that this is the main sticking point that we're running into uh, in thinking about ways to address header protection. Um, and in particular, just to be clear, backward compatibility means um, a legacy client that is capable of reading the message, but uh, maybe doesn't know about the header protection scheme that we settle on, what happens for them when they receive a message that has protected headers? Mm -hmm. That's, that, is the, that is the specific um, situation. And uh, I do think that that's a, a relevant factor for mm -hmm. making a decision about how we do this. Yeah. yeah. So should we just leave that like, still open and decide later what we need? Is that the conclusion of the room? I think most of the discussion we will have today is sort of yeah. related to this, and it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's variation of this, you know, UI issues and a, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, about so leave it for now. So issue three will be postponed. Then what I would like to know is, hmm, of those people who have read the draft and know what kind of requirements are in, uh, do. Do we have a complete set of requirements and are there requirements that need to be adjusted? So first question again, who has read the draft from to the end? That's about double as last time. <laughs> <laughs> there were about three hands like, or something? Like two. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Ross, can I ask you a question? You about, may. Um, what do you think we should do with the requirements part? Is it just helping us to to make a decision? Do you want to last call on the requirements, even if we don't publish the document? What do you want to do as a chair? I, I don't think the requirements are helping us make decisions at this point. Um, I think that we need to propose solutions uh, to go forward and have the discussion from that perspective. The I think the requirements um, got us to a good place where we are now, but let's focus on getting a solution that everybody can live with. I think it's going to be a balancing act, as we've just yes. heard. And so it's can we find a balance point that we can all live with or we're all equally unhappy with? <laughs> right. Okay. So, yeah. Shall we then go to the next slide or do you have another comment? So, oh, to, to the answer of should we publish it, I think it'd be fine to leave it as an appendix to the final solution document. Yeah. That works for me. Um, okay, so the next two slides will be probably causing some more lively discussions. Um, it is one aspect uh, that actually triggered these things, not the only one, but uh, one aspect we already had some comments on the mic on this. Basically, how do we deal with uh, rendering issues at the receiving site? Uh, Alexei's term for this was weird artifacts. So some art, some situations that uh, the receiving users are confused, or how do we help broken clients that cannot handle uh, encapsulated messages and thus also not the forwarded messages because it's basically it appears to be the same on the MIME layer. So how do we help them? And what we're talking about is some uh, messages you receive. You receive an empty message. In best case, you see there is an attachment. And sometimes you're able to open the attachment, sometimes not. And these kind of things. They have been discovered some time ago. Not sure whether all of these discoveries are still apply or whether there have been, has been some improvements in clients. Because they anyway need to fix this for forwarded messages. Um, yeah, so that's what we assume that there's a problem in that area. So how do we deal with that problems is we can tell 
the broken implementations fix it. Because if you cannot for show or if you cannot display forwarded message properly, and uh, of course, then you can also not uh, display the encapsulated messages properly. Um, this is like one way to solve it. And the other one is we are making a new standard that helps the broken implementation or like that overcomes their weaknesses. So I, I call it the workaround to the broken implementation, which some people in the room probably don't agree that it's a workaround or, but uh, I see it this way. The clients are broken and are we fixing the clients or are we going to, um, uh, to do it that the clients don't make this anymore? Like, are we fixing something in the format that the clients uh, don't do these weird artifacts anymore? So I think I finished the slides before you uh, give your comment. Um, so I, I just wanted, to, I think you were referring to me when you said some people in the room don't think this is a workaround. Um, so I, I was going to explain uh, my perspective on why I think it is a workaround, but if you'd rather finish the slides, we okay. can do that. Okay, I didn't speak out any particular, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just made some assumptions. <laughs> okay, so uh, this workaround, uh, actually he was one of the key uh, participants of this workaround. It's known as memory hole or nowadays as uh, legacy display, you say. So the workaround suggests a new uh, MIME node that contains the protected headers. Uh, in a structure. So it's not like putting the whole message in a wrap. It's putting like uh, splitting up the message in headers and uh, content and make two MIME attachments. I hope I explained it correctly. Otherwise, you can correct later. If it's not correctly explained. Uh, in any case, it means it's a deviation from the current MIME standards, which says like you wrap the whole message in. It would allow, depending on the interpretation, it would allow also such things, but this is not like how it has been designed earlier. So the current MIME standard says you take the whole message and encapsulate it. So the conclusion more or less at this time is we need more research, in particular on the receiving side. Uh, one thing is if you do such a workaround, what kind of problems causes this? We already know of uh, some impacts on MIME libraries, especially if you don't write them on your old libraries, if you use some and you need to adjust them and so on. This, uh, I call them as well side effects have been discovered. And also like if we do the, this uh, memory hole approach or then there may be, or there are other uh, weird uh, artifacts whether or not they are worse or better, I don't know at this time, but uh, still uh, also some clients do not display well what we would do in a workaround as described by the draft or mentioned above. And we need to update the existing research that has been done earlier on the weird artifacts, so like on the clients that do not behave well when header protection is applied as it's defined in SMIME. I hope I could provide a good summary and uh, open the discussion about this topic, how we go on. Uh, hi, uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore. So I'm one of the authors of the the draft that describes the legacy display part up there. Um, so thank you for including that and mentioning it. Um, so the uh, I'm not sure how many people have read the the draft autocrypt lamps protected headers mm -hmm. uh, up there. Um, can we is it, people up for raising your hand if you've read if you've read that draft? Okay, so. The same <laughs> <laughs> relatively relatively small number as well so just to be clear that draft just describes two different things um, that are used in conjunction to try to offer a form of header protection one thing is basically placing the mime headers that you care about at the top of the um, primary mime part that's sort of the cryptographic payload and it describes how to how to find the cryptographic payload that's how you, that those are the protected headers. And then it has this additional legacy display part that is intended to provide visibility to an obscured subject line in an encrypted email. Um, the, it does not stick all of the additional protected headers 
uh, right? Every header is protected in the sense that it is within the cryptographic uh, envelope, um, including you know message ID and things that the user is never exposed to. Um, but the only things that show up in the legacy display part are the parts are the things that the user would typically be expected to see. We call them user facing headers in that document. Um, so that legacy display part is really only to make sure that a, an obscured user facing header is visible to the user of a legacy uh, client. That is a client that's capable of decrypting the messages and uh, but it but doesn't know about uh, protected headers. So the goal is explicitly uh, backward compatibility for that part. But that part is not uh, intended to be uh, treated specially um, by the receiving client. The only actual special thing that, that the client that, that a non-legacy client does when it sees a legacy display part is hide it because it actually knows what the actual protected headers are by looking in the mind structure of the of the of the received message. So I just wanted to point out that that this legacy display mechanism is one piece of uh, of a broader puzzle for how for how this stuff fits together. Um, I recommend I, I would appreciate more comments on the document. Uh, it will get updated again shortly. Um, it, it's currently documented for PGP MIME because that's where it's actively in use. There are multiple implementations in the wild. Um, but I believe it is compatible with SMIME, and I will be expanding it to cover SMIME in the next version. Okay. Um, I should be clear. I also welcome additional contributors to that draft. Uh, so if folks are, are are interested in it, I'm happy to um, to work with with you all. Okay. Right. So. Um... Who are you? I, Alexi, still. Um, I think this slide and the previous slide that Bernie showed is trying to get to the sticking point we are at. Uh, it looks like the only way we can make progress is to analyze how big of an impact um, legacy display issue is with you know wrapping messages as well as you know memory hole approach and as well as look at APIs and their limitations in open source projects and other things uh, I know it's somewhat open-ended question how, how far do we look how many implementations we evaluate but it would be nice at this point to collect uh, both screenshots uh, uh, trying to send you know this Header protected messages to old clients and see how they display, to see how bad the problem is, um, uh, and for people to report issues with API, how difficult it is for them to handle on the receiving side, both approaches. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe one approach to doing that is to be a little more crisp in the question and then ask uh, maybe through SurveyMonkey or something like that on the list for people to look at their own clients and report what they see. Yeah, and maybe we sort of do a mini interrupt type thing. I'm, That's what I mean. If you have yeah, a test yeah. message of a of choice A and a test message of choice B. Sure. Uh, this is DKG. So uh, in draft autocrypt lamps protected headers dash zero one, there are test messages. And if anybody wants to try to, and those test messages work from uh, using, they are open PGP, uh, PGP MIME messages, and they can be decrypted by the secret keys that are available in the reference draft. That draft refers to another draft that has a, some sample um, open PGP secret keys uh, and uh, open PGP certificates that are capable of verifying the signatures and decrypting those things. So if anybody has an email client that they use or that they work on um, or just that they know of uh, and have access to that can deal with PGP MIME messages and they want to test those things, uh, I would love it if you could test it and send back a screenshot to the list to be even more specific um, uh, or a pointer to the screenshots. I will try to collect those if they come in on the list. Um, but so we have test vectors and I aim to create test vectors for SMIME messages as well. As I said, the next revision of the draft, I will I will happily work with anybody who wants to to make um, SMIME test vectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
if it helps me in my uh, email client, which is webmail based, uh, I can generate the type of messages. So it might be easy for me to just if Free. people if people want to volunteer so that I send them messages and they send back screenshots and describe, you know, or oh, this crashed my client or, you know, this didn't display or this is truncated. I think this would be very useful at this point. Right. I, we, we do need to do this for SMIME because that's what the charter is here. Um, don't mind helping the other community along as well, but that's what the focus needs to be. Yeah. If we can just have the test messages and have a discussion about what the user experience is with each of the approaches to find that equally unhappy point. So the other um, the other question that Alexei asked, so one of them was, how do legacy clients deal with these messages? Mm -hmm. And the second question that he asked was, how do the libraries deal with them? So this, effect, this addresses Bernie's question here about adverse side effects on MIME libraries. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering if we can't ask that as a more specific question as well, right? So we said, I think in this case, we want test vectors. For, for, for the UI, we want test vectors and basically screenshots, Yep. right? So my question is, what, do, what is the question we are asking for MIME libraries? Yeah, so what the, the same test messages could be used. The question is, what's the response you want back? Yeah, and some well, uh, sometimes you can imply the answer from how it's displayed or not displayed, and sometimes you might need to dig a bit further, right? So the answer might not be obvious. So I think you know, for example, one issue might be if people have a limit on how big this header can be for memory keyhole approach. That's arguably it's a bug, but if if it truncates it, then it would be nice to know and who does it or, 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 or uh, things like this, right? Well, so, so yeah, I don't. So, so, so actually, sorry, the question about the UI for legacy clients says, what do legacy clients do? Right? We're gonna we all acknowledge that the legacy clients will be with us forever because this is email, <laughs> and we just want to know what they do so we know what what kinds of things we're, mm -hmm. we are emitting. But the MIME library's question is more, I think, a question of um, do we think that existing mail user agents will be able to do something better with this than what the legacy clients do? Right? Will your MIME, will your MIME lib, will you be able to make the next version of your mail user agent actually work with these messages, these protected messages in a in in a better way? Right? What is the upgrade path? And that's a different question from like. How is your current MIME library choking on this? So I would like to, like. Well, I think it does matter if it's causing a crash. Yes, right. right. You're, you're right. So there's, okay. so that's one, that's one piece of it. But the other piece of it is like, can we work with it? Right. When Krista yeah. spoke with us, uh, I think it was two sessions ago, um, she identified that working with the MIME library that they had was like, in more detail was problematic, that they had to actually go like fix something in the MIME library. But I don't understand what that constraint was, and I don't know how to ask someone to articulate that constraint. Yeah. One has to implement to actually understand what problem she ran into. Um, I would like to bring the discussion another aspect. Um, I don't know how many SMIME implementations do we have in the world, and is this really an issue for SMIME implementations we have? So far, we have no, we know that this has been a problem with PGP MIME, but I don't know about concrete S MIME cases. Maybe you have an answer. Um, well, we have at minimum Thunderbird and Outlook. Um, I think we have Gmail. Uh, we have iOS client is S MIME capable. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe things like evolution, and that there are maybe some Android clients. I I don't know about so so. about ten or is that. <sighs> yeah, I would. Yeah, at, at least six probably. We maybe yeah. more. Well, something between five and ten. So let's Normal. get the test messages so together. Then we can ask the list. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, I guess we did do these things called implementation reports. 
And one of them was done for CMS, and there's a whole bunch of implementations that are listed in there. I, I can't hear you, sir. I have no idea. Sean, you're not to... talking to the microphone. So well, way back in the day, we did these things called implementation reports when you move standards along the standardization path. And when, one was done for CMS. And so I believe that there were nine implementations. I have no idea whether they're alive or not, but I can certainly provide the pointer to the, the thing about what it tested. Yeah. So I think we need six messages to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Signed, encrypted, signed and encrypted, and the two approaches. So it's I can also generate things, triple wrap right? messages now. This is fun. <laughs> Three layers of with header protection, you know. I think that's. The, I don't think we can answer the question that's being asked with less than six. Is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Probably <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, how many weeks do you guys need to put together these? <sighs> I think it would help to have a deadline. So I would say a couple of weeks. So while we're still fresh after ITF. So middle of December? That's when I'm returning from holiday. Should I be involved? <laughs> that's that's fine with me. I'm happy. I, I can I can deliver test vectors uh, for the the approach that I documented in, in that, that several of us mm -hmm. documented in this draft autocrypt lamps. Um, I, I can probably deliver them by the end of the week. Oh, this week. Well. <laughs> So the question is the other two, <laughs> the the other approach that we want to compare it to, right? Yeah, I probably realistically would say next week I can I can do some stuff on this. Mm. All right, a couple weeks is fine. I mean, yeah, with the holidays approaching, but let's but let's get this started so we can find out what mm. we. And I think uh, my uh, call for the people in the room and listening is, if you have your favorite clients that you really care about help us you know then test it right yeah exactly you know please uh yeah send me and bernie and dkg emails and mm -hmm. we'll we'll test it with with your client well okay i can't be involved in the next two weeks because i will be in new zealand having holiday <laughs> question is do i have to be involved well uh, we can figure this out, you know. You, you can connect me to your coworkers, right? So we can. Right. And, and you guys can sort that out, you know, mm -hmm. not real time. <laughs> right. Just before you leave here, have a plan. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, great. Then I, I I'm pleased we have a, a way to compare these. Yeah, that brings us some basis to uh, choose a solution. So what I see is next steps um, we already discussed on the second last more research on the weird artifacts that we already like this decided now. I would like to close the open issues, but probably I'm not going to close them. So hmm, well, I have to update on the first one. Um, do we need to confirm the set of requirements on the mailing list? I would suggest so. Uh, Reach out to implementers would also be a good idea. Maybe this can be combined with the current approach, like to see whether this is it. It's based on requirements and update the requirements ID. And at some point in time, we should start on the solution ID. Okay, that was it from my side. Okay, thank you. So that is our one chartered item. The next thing we want to talk about is uh, Hendrik um, with the CMP profile and update. Yeah, thanks, Russ. So I put the status Here's of the both ID of both IDs into one presentation. So to be a bit quicker through this. Oh. Ah, great. <laughs> okay. We'll deal with it. So. Okay, so this is um, the status of the results of the last two meetings. Um, already for the July meeting I split the 
um, profile document into a profile and an updates document as we discussed in um, in Prague. I included since um, July the encrypted value um, exchange with um, encrypted key as this was discussed as a preferred solution to enable envelope data for the, the encrypted key packages. Yeah, we started in the recharter, so we are in the queue for the um, um, the IESG um, meeting in, in early December. And yeah, so we decided that the update CMP should be a um, standard track RFC at least. And we have some milestones um, for the rechartering. So I think we are on a good way. Okay, so status of the light white CMP profile since uh, the last version from July, I mainly um, completed the the content of the document. So I added um, the support of legacy PKIs, the legacy CAs with um, transport of uh, P10 requests. I added this um, yeah, quite quite large chapter on the central key generation and the encrypted transport of key packages with different um, key transport and, and key establishment um, mechanisms. I added the section on the delayed enrollment part with a um, polling mechanism and I added some um, examples for support messages um, using this uh, general message, general response uh, feature of CMP. And uh, yeah, so they are optional, but um, we know that there are quite some use cases where um, getting a CA chain, um, updating a root certificate with this um, quadruple of um, certificates and uh, getting some request parameters in advance to an enrollment. So there are some examples of how to utilize these general message concept in, in CMP. Yeah, what are the next steps for, for the profiling um, draft? So, of course, um, discussing feedbacks from, from different sites, from the working group and others, or also deciding on um, whether to incorporate. Um, so, we have a request response um, profile specified for enrolling to a new PKI. Um, so it's quite academic. We could also use this for an existing um, already trusted PKI. Um, but in CMP, this is handled with a different message type. So we could um, discuss whether to specify also this. So it's it's it not, not really different to the one with a new uh, PKI, actually. But we could uh, could address this as an optional one. If yeah, I'm happy for for feedback on on this. For this um, central key generation part, um, if you want to make use of the symmetric um, key encryption key uh, um, management technique. Um, you need to make use of a shared secret. If you have some one-time password mechanism that you also want to use for the MAC protection of the CMP message, you may want to derive a different um, shared secret from that one-time password for the um, key transport um, mechanism. And um, therefore, we propose to use this um, MAC, um, this password-based MAC parameter uh, mechanism from the CMP um, MAC protection, uh, even though it it does not fully fit. And I left some some comments in the in the draft, the profiling draft, and I'm happy for feedback on on that whether people think that mechanism fits. So there is a section on the transport of CMP messages for file-based transport. So um, I'm, I'm not sure whether to really 
fully specify that maybe I just do some some references and some more general description on what to to think about if you want to do the message transport on on an offline or file based uh, transport but yeah if there is uh, feelings about this section please let me know then in the update cmp i will come to that in the on the next slide we um, added three extended uh, key usages for use in in cmp and i would like to incorporate and describe how to make use of this in the context of the profile so this is something i didn't manage to do uh, since the last update yeah we have some oids that are needed especially for the um, support messages they need to be specified and registered at iana and yeah of course, um, the security is consideration. I have to think about whether to, to add new parts to that or not. And of course, uh, polishing and, and typos are still to be done. Okay, any questions to the CMP profiling document? Okay. So the CMP updates is, is much um, shorter. So what I did since the last update, I added the section on these extended key usages. Um, so we think three extended key usages are quite, quite helpful. One to uh, specify keys of a CMP certification authority, one for CMP registration authority, and one for the ACMP key generation authority specifically used when you um, have central key generation because generating a public private key pair on behalf of some other entity is a really specific role and this I think should probably be um, yeah, identified. Yeah, I added the section or I updated the chapter on encrypted values in the CMP document um, with regard to uh, making use of encrypted key and therefore envelope data. But I kept it quite short and the, the details on how to make use of it and how to implement it are then in the profiling document. Yeah, I did some minor um, generalization in two sections of the CMP document. One is on nested messages so there was or there is currently a sentence that you should only um, incorporate uh, cmp messages of the same type in um, nested messages we do make use of nested messages also for um, bundling um, messages on an array side to forward that and we see it as a disadvantage if you are restricted to only incorporate same message types in one nested message and therefore we would propose or like to propose to to just delete the sentence actually we we didn't find any good reason why to to restrict ourselves <laughs> that much um, the second part is while um, writing the profiling on the polling mechanism, we um, realized that the polling was not, or whether the, the PKCS 10 certificate request transport was not covered by polling. And we thought quite a while about it. Um, this is finally, I think, because a PKCS 10 or P10 CR CMP message has no request ID and is pro can can typically only be used with one request in one message and that uh, is a restriction we anyhow have with the profiling and we would therefore like to to open um, CMP also for polling on P10 CRs um, in case there is only one request in it so both are quite uh, generic and uh, general. So I, I have a parts. quick question. Um, yeah. I'm not understanding the uh, reason for the extended key usage for a CA. You either have uh, 
the cert sign uh, key usage or the basic constraints with the CA value set to true to know whether it's a, a certification authority? What does this additional uh, way of telling uh, provide you? So finally, if the CA signs um, the CMP message, you may not want to make use of the CA certificate and key for this, and therefore the CA may want to use a different a key and different certificate, but still it's the CA that signs the message. I'm, I'm not understanding the flow that you just described. So to to make sure that you are not using the CA key too mm -hmm. often, mm -hmm. you may not want to make use of the same key for signing certificate than for protecting CMP messages. And therefore a CA may want to use a different um, key and certificate for signing the CMP messages. I see. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, so what are the next steps for this? Um, yeah, of course, discussing whatever feedback there is. And um, add the extended key usages to the profile document as said. Uh, adding the OIDs for these key usages and register them at IANA. Um, of course, at the security considerations part. There is a completion of the ASN1 module needed. Maybe I, I need some guidance on, on how to do and how much to to really is needed to add to this draft. And yeah, of course, polishing and typos need to be done too. Yeah, so that's it from my part. Okay, thank you. Sorry, it took me a second to remember this, but there's also there's also a key usage for um, registrations authority and CMC. So you yes. might look there, so you don't need to necessarily register a new one. You can just use it. We we could yet just use it. So that's a point of of discussion. Yeah. As it is uh, named CMCRA, I yeah, just didn't. I, I, want I would to. like to think that that OID, that that string is not encoded in any way that anyone any normal human being would read that it would be perfectly fine to just yeah, use the I, I would be fine with that. <laughs> Thanks. Sean reads OIDs. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, other topics we were gonna talk about today, Michael Richardson um, on the RFC 7030 EST. I did not get any slides, so I'm assuming you have little to say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. I posted a new document, uh, which I think uh, has Russ's nicely ASN module that Sean formatted nicely. Um, and um, like, that's really it, right? <laughs> um, there's there's a, a third issue that I, which there's errata on, um, and I'm not qualified to understand it at this point. Um, so I'm seeking help for that, um, but mostly the working group said they needed to recharter and to adopt this rather short document. So please read it, and yeah, the chairs yeah. will do something. I hope, we right? Have a, a little bit of a backlog there. Right? Yeah. So um, I, I don't think it's a big rush or anything. Just you know, that's all. Please read the document, and if you have some expertise on the third piece of errata, I don't. I really just I, I just don't get it. So. Thanks. Sean, I posted your slides, but they're not appearing here. You got to reload the whole agenda page. There it is. 
Hello, my name is Sean Turner. These slides should look very familiar as they are exactly the slides that I presented at IETF 105. So why am I here? Um, 5480, um, section three provides some information um, about key usages uh, for the subject being subject public key info for our IDEC public key, IDEC MQV, and IDEC DH. But only, only seven of the nine values are described. That seems like a flaw. Um, so we'd like to fix that. So what we're proposing is um, to provide new, new requirements for a key encipherment and data encipherment to say that they must not be set for those things. Um, I will channel, channel Ryan Sleevey, who is not here, who said, yes, please, this has caused us problems in the past. Um, please do so. So that's it. The draft is like literally a page long. Um, with the extra boilerplate from the IETF, it's maybe one and a half. Um, please adopt me when you can. I will send I will send a send a message to the mailing list once I sit down. Yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we're way running out of time. Uh, we have less than five minutes, so I'm not even going to put my slides up. Just going to say there's a CMS update for algorithm protection uh, document. Um, if you have uh, CMS embedded in your brain, you'll you'll understand quickly that um, when you there's two hashes computed to sign a message. One is you hash the content, that value gets put in a signed attribute. Then you take all the signed attributes and compute the hash over that, and that's what gets signed. The um, issue is that with the number of hash algorithms we're getting that are, have all the same lengths, it might be possible to do a hash substitution attack if it turns out that one of these hash algorithms is weak. So the proposed text says, use the same hash algorithm in both cases, don't get tricked, and points to RFC 6211, which is include a message that has the identifiers for the hashes as well as the hash values themselves. That's it, it's kind of a situation where uh, we used to have only one algorithm that was 256 bit long, and that is no longer the case. And so we just want to include the algorithm identifier in the protection. Um, Max, you asked for some time in the uh, if time allows, and I'm going to say time is not allowing. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, I believe we've reached the agenda end because of that. Uh, I don't think you could have gotten your point across in uh, three minutes anyway. Um, so is there any other business than Max's presentation that uh, will take less than two minutes? In that case, we're, uh, we're done and uh, have a good dinner. Uh, blue sheets, can somebody bring them forward? <laughs> 